Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, I've been invited here to talk about some aspects of electroacoustic composition, and people were invited to bring files so that they could. Um, I would have some something to work with, and what I think is probably very valuable for people who are doing electroacoustic work is to see how other people find their work on the first the first point of contact, and. This is, uh, this is, without going into the detail of who and what and where and how, how and why, this is what I receive, okay? And I'm looking at this file, <coughs> and this is the work I get. So I will open the file, and I will look at it in this view, and the first thing I'm going to do in here is I'm going to go, oh, it doesn't quite come, it doesn't, I don't quite get the window. There's a, there's a window up here under analysis. I'm going to look at the waveform statistics on this, on this file. And we'll see that the peak amplitude is normal, is a uh, minus 0.5 dB on both channels. There's silence on both channels. The average RMS is minus 14, and the maximum RMS is minus seven minus eight these are very good figures they give you a very clear sense in listening to this that the levels are high they've been well they've been adjusted for the full use of the amplitude available in here and there's no dc offset so the dc offset that may have come into the signal has been removed so it's technically been worked out to be quite correct but i look at this and i will then consider whether or not this can actually be played into an acoustical environment. And I've taken that section, I've done, there's a waveform analysis, and the, mac the minimum is minus 24, the maximum is minus 7, and the average is minus 10, which is fine. And now I come to this section. Let me just make one small modification here so I can see where we are. I need the, the, the software has, has not been completely set up, so it's, there's just a few small things I need to do to do this. I need to view customers toolbar. In here, I, what I would like to be able to see um, the beginning and the end of the file, of, of the section in here and what else do I want to see? For the moment that, that's that's fine. So we can see that this goes from 38 to 106 so that's um, 40, 22, 40, 40, no, 20, is it 106? Yeah. It's about 30 seconds. So let's have a look at what the amplitude level is during that 30 seconds. And, the waveform statistics. and we see that the average level is minus 50. That's the average RMS level of that section. If we're going to have a peak amplitude in the space of 85 dB, if we're going to limit this amplitude in the space to 85 dB, the average level of this section is going to be 35 dBA which is basically, in most situations, well below the ambient noise level in, the, in, in wherever you are. In other words, that's silent. In this, where we are right now, there's a fan, which is an unusual situation, but this fan is somewhere around 55 or 60 dB. Therefore, if we have peaks from these speakers of 85 dB, we have a 25 dB or, dB or 30 dB dynamic range in here. So, what happens with a piece that's done in this way is it becomes not transportable. It can't be played in a wide variety of environments. It couldn't be played in a car. It couldn't be, be played in the kitchen, because in the kitchen, the ambient noise level could be between 45 and 50, 50, 55 dB. And if you're not going to go above 85 dB, then you're dealing with a dynamic range in the situation of having 30 or 35 dB. And so in one sense, what I started to look at in this is how transportable the file is going to be in this way. 
if you have this on your iPod and you're out on the street you can't listen to this because the dynamic range is so wide that it's restricted as to, as to exactly where you're going to be able to listen to this. In this kind of situation, as a composer, you may decide to do two mixes. And one mix is going to be for the concert situation, and the other one is going to be for general distribution. Because if you send this to a radio station, they can't play it. Because FM radio has a, has a dynamic range of maximally about 28 dB. So if you send it to, or if you play it over the web, and someone wants to play it from the web, you're dealing with someone sitting with their speakers on the, next to their computer, and they have the noise of the fans from the computer going on, they have other sound, sounds going on. But the radio, don't, co don't compress or don't change the signal automatically no, no, before no. putting it onto air? On no, I'm talking about transportability. We were about radio, radio Canada, Radio Canada would, would they, they, when they detect that signal, mm -hmm. they would think that they've lost the signal and they would cut in with pre-recorded music. We are, we saw, we, we saw we've lost the, this transmission <laughs> because they won't do that. The, uh, FM, other FM stations would do that, but Radio Canada and other stations, when they detect almost no signal at the transmitter, will assume there's been a lost connection to the studio and will put in the filler on the air. If this were played on uh, KPFA in San Francisco, which is a community radio station, when that gets through the system, what happens is you have other kinds of problems. Because what you want to do here is if you want to think, well, can't you put an expander on this? Well, let's have, let's have a look and see what happens in, in the expansion mode. So what I will do is I'm going to try and raise this whole thing by, let me just amplify it for a moment. Um, I'm going to come into here. I, I'll amplify it by 6 dB. And now you have a problem. And the problem is that all of your peaks are now being clipped. So you can't simply amplify the signal. Because if I go back up to into here and look at the signal again, we'll see that we have 770,000 and 893,000 clipped waveforms. And that was with 6 dB of amplification, straight amplification. So it can't be done by, ampli by amplification. The reason I keep coming back to looking at the file is that the file, the signal is what's here. This is what people get. They can't make assessments on a piece by piece and section by section piece and try and figure out what's going to happen. And so this is a, there's a problem here that because of these sections of very low level, while overall the levels are very high, these sections make the piece virtually non-transportable. You go to a situation, a concert somewhere, and if it's at a place that has a concert hall, they try and keep the ambient noise at 18 dB, which is extremely, extremely low. Even 30 dB is, is quite low. <coughs> With 50 dB of dynamic range, this section, this 30 or 40 seconds here, is going to be almost at the inaudible level. And that's given the fact that the people who are listening have not had damaged hearing. Because if the hearing has been damaged and they have threshold of 40 dB, that will be silent. And this is a, a situation that composers have to deal with in trying to figure out exactly what it is to put in a signal which is 50 dB below the peak levels of this. So I'm going to back. it's done for concerns. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what the, co what the considerations are. I'm not saying that <coughs> if you only intend to have this played in concert and never put it on CD Sorry. and never have it broadcast, then you can do what you like as long as you are mm -hmm. assured that every place you're going to play it will have this 50 or 60 dB of dynamic range available in acoustically in the space. Because I'm trying to make a distinction here between what is happening to the signal, which is the electrical part of this, and acoustically in, in the space. And if the idea is, well, I'll play it in here and I'll do sound projection and I will bring this up, the question is, why are you going to bring it up? Yeah. You should be able to, if the piece, just put it on and let it play and it should come out. If you're going to bring it up, then I would say bring it up before you take it there and let 
the performer who's going to play it into the space bring the levels down <coughs> so what would happen here is this is where, where the signal is I'm going to use a, a different tool um, to, to do this I will use um, the AU effects in here the, the peak limiter which is available for, on the OSX oh that's interesting I don't know that one, but it's okay. Attack time, we'll keep the attack time really low. Oops, the other way. Really, I can't make this mouse work. There we go. I keep the release time really low. And I'm going to put the gain in here up by, I can't see, is that? Is it 23 degrees? Let's start with. Let's have a look at what happens. At, it's at about 15, at about uh, 13, at about 12 dB, and apply that to the signal. And now everything is being amplified by 12 dB, except the signals that reach zero. As they get into the top 12 dB up here, they're not amplified. So what's happened in here? This section and this section are being brought up. These sections are being brought up somewhat. But now we, when we look at the, the waveform statistics, we find that the minimum is still down here. The average is a little higher. The maximum is a bit higher. There's some clipping because I just used a, a very brute force way of doing it. And if we come back to this section and see what is happening to the signal, we find that the average is up at minus 40, as it would, it would be raised by 12 dB, which is what it was in, in effect. This is still a very low signal to have for a duration here of some 30 odd seconds. If you're going to be doing sound projection or diffusion, diffusion with this, I would suggest that the quiet levels be brought up higher so that you have the capacity to bring the level down for the quiet things. And you can shape it in the space. But this is this is wait two seconds. In this situation, in the situation the file came in, if I wanted to amplify this, I couldn't. I would have maybe six dB of gain left in the system, because if the faders are set at zero for the peak levels, and I, the faders only go to plus six, I could only bring that up by six dB. In which case, it only will come up to acoustically forty-four dB for that amount of time. But bringing it down isn't something that, I mean, this is something that maybe the composer does, but somebody who's doing the piece as a performer, uh, and this is the same as you, as you find in instrumental music, the performer assumes that what's in the score or what's in the piece is what the composer intended. So they're not going to think, <coughs> they're not gonna, they won't be able to assume that they're going to need to bring a level of a quiet section down because it's because the composer has adjusted it, for it. It depends how far you go. At, at this point, at the point of the original file, it's only presentable by the composer. It's not transportable. It can't yeah. be. It can't be broadcast. Yeah. It can't be played in other kinds of environments. And if that's what you want, then that's what you have. But you still have the situation that because this is so low, if you want to add 12 dB of this in performance, you can't, because at zero, the acoustical level is already minus 50. It's already down at, at 35 dB. And the mixer only has another 6 dB of gain. And that's why uh, the consideration in doing the composition is about this. Let's, ha let's have a look at this section and see. This is uh, how long? 39 seconds. 39 seconds. And I'm going to leave out the peak to avoid having it, it shifted from this. And here we have the average RMS of minus 30, which is 20 dB below the peak levels of the, of the peak. So this, will, this entire section, acoustically, will be in the 65 to 70 dB range, acoustically in the hall. And if the hall is a little bit noisy, that's, that's quite listenable. It's just, and we, I've already put 12 dB of boost on here. You can get, a, it's in the hall, if you want to get a little more, you have more in the faders that you can, you can add to this. But the system can't add 12 dBs of signals because most people are working at around the zero on the mixer 
and they're only going to get three to sixty dB more gain. Yeah. Just to be clear, you're not suggesting to do this on the whole file. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm bringing forward a compositional issue here, mm -hmm. and the compositional issue is, for example, in the Tchaikovsky Sixth Symphony, at mm -hmm. the end of the exposition, the bass clarinet goes down to five P's, P and a C C C mo, followed by this. Fortissimo in the orchestra. No one can play five P's on the bass clarinet in that register. The composer is indicating that this is morendo, this is dying, this is death. And the bass clarinet player lives in fear of squeaking on this thing. And because it's a it's the balance between playing getting enough air into the clarinet to sound the note, but not so much as to be loud. <clears throat> but Tchaikovsky is saying, I want this to be really, really, really quiet. And we haven't listened to these sounds. This may be a sound which innately says quiet. But at the level of the pure signal, when I open this, I look at this and I, I'm concerned. When I listen at home, to these pieces, I set my amplifier to 52. It's a Sony amplifier goes from zero up to a number. I know that if I listen from the computer, I set my amplifier to 52, I have a, a reference level. I know everything that comes out of the speakers is going to be the same. And therefore I can compare files as to how much what the levels are because I have set a reference level. In the studio, in doing a mix, if you can't hear that, you can't turn up the amplifier in the studio. If you turn up the amplifier, you no longer have a point of reference as to what it is you're hearing. You have to, in the studio, go in, establish what your zero is, and never touch the amplifier, and never touch anything beyond the master of the mixer that's going into the file. Because that otherwise, you can't compare what you did one day with what you're going to be doing another day. You lose the control, it's not loud enough, it's with the two, it's, if it's lo not loud enough, that's an acoustical problem. If the signal isn't of high enough amplitude, that's a different problem that you need to fix in getting the signal to set up this way. So these are considerations in, in what is to be done. In the performance situation, it, in this, well, you'll have to come and listen to, to what happens downstairs here at Mesa. The ambient noise in that space is between 35 and 40 dB. If you're not going to produce 93 dB ear shattering peaks in there, then you're going to have a 50, maybe a 50 dB dynamic, dynamic range. When it gets down to the 45 dB level, really, really quiet, you can hear the traffic going by outside. The piece will be masked by external sounds, and the composer needs to be aware of what that's going to be. In a rave, what they will do is they'll just flatten, they'll just compress the whole thing so it, it won't drop down in the levels of this. So this is a consideration that, but I haven't even li listened to the piece yet. Right? I'm looking at it in these terms and I see that we have at the end here, I should back up and uh, remove that other stuff I did there. And I opened it up. And then we're back to the, the, the originals. And so we have this section. Now, we don't know how loud that should be. And I think that that should be louder, acoustically, right? You want it louder. But I don't have a mixer here. So there's not much I can do about that. <laughs> mm. Okay, you can bring it up. Okay. And then you can control your volume. Yeah, over here. Yeah, I, I, yeah, but that wasn't that, that's <coughs> that wasn't the point of what I was saying, but that's okay. Yeah. I find that just a little uncomfortably loud. Just a little uncomfortable. Mm. And 
that I have. What? Pardon? It's very noisy in here. It's very noisy in here. But transportability of files has to be. That's a, let's, see, let's see what happens over here. Well, having read this piece, wait, of wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm not taking. I'm, I'm treating this completely abstractly. No, no, but I'm uh, building on what you were saying. I've no, heard uh, the piece. Wait, I've heard the piece in several several spaces, and when it's played as a mm. stereo file, there are spaces where it's really, really, really not. You wait, wait. Let, really let, let me. Let, I, haven't I hadn't finished. I hadn't. I hadn't finished. I hadn't finished what I was saying. I want to get to this sound. get to this sound. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to normalize this sound. My question is, do those so two sounds like the same sound like the same sound? And the answer is no. It's because the application of the loudness curve is going to change the quality of the sound. And I would say that it, in the studio, it wasn't listened to at this level. It wasn't listened to at that level, but it wasn't listened to at the previous level either. It wasn't listened to at this level. Because it should have been listened to uh, at some point, it should be listened to. Let me go back here. It should be listened to at this level. take a little bit of top off to get a little more precision on this. Why I don't think it was monitored at that level, I will demonstrate by doing this. I'm going to turn it down just a little bit for the ears. I would suggest listening to that for about 10 minutes mm -hmm. and determining, as a, as a composer, if you like everything that's in there or whether it's one part of it after 10 minutes begins to wear on you. And if you find there's something in there that you like, then you know that's what you want to keep. And if you find there's something that you just don't want to hear anymore, then you know that's the part of the sound you want to remove. And if it's monitored at this level, you hear it one way. When it's monitored, however, at this level, there's a whole lot of interesting parts in that sound when listened to at a higher level. 
as the composer you may want to decide that some parts of those sound of that sound you want to keep or you want to bring forward and so when you would be at this stage my suggestion to you would be to listen at this level and also to listen at the higher level listen to the, the kind of breathing wind noise in there which is really a very interesting a very interesting sound let me just try and pick one Do a little amplification in that. Oh, we'll do 12 maybe. the wind, the breath, and you can hear the male choir coming underneath. In this and now the question is, for you as the composer, is that the balance you want between the three parts of the repeating ding 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 and the male parts? Because if you monitor at a different level, the relationship is going to change. And when you compose, if you compose a piece like that and this part actually is very low, and you like that ambience because it's so, so undefined, maybe it's what the composers like. Right? It's, it's I, different I, to listen to it I, very I, high. See, I'm, I'm, I'm being really metric about this. I haven't talked about the con composer's intentions. Yeah. I've asked you to listen to what happens when you have this listened to at different levels in the studio. Mm. It's not about the composer's intention. The composer will decide what they want to have. And once you as the composer decide what you want to have, then you have to create whatever the balance is that you're going to need to have that to do that. And you hear how the, the, the male chorus begins, three, it, it come, it's brought up three quarters of the way through, but it's there at the beginning. It's still, in, it's one of the layers of the sound. Yeah. That one. Now it comes up, but it was there all the way along. At the lower level, it's inaudible at the beginning. And my question is, why is it there? Because if you again amplify this, this is this applies across everything. Everything you do in the studio, this, these kinds of questions are, are, are essential and critical to this. So let me amplify this again. I'll bring up another 12 dB. to hear that in this in, in this loop sound ding 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 there's a DC offset there's a low frequency thump in there now you may want to think that people can't hear that but there are pe there are listeners who have worked in studios a long time who will listen to the set acoustically at 45 dB and they will hear the DC offset in that signal they will hear they will hear that. If you don't want that, you have to make sure you remove it from the signal. And so, in this, and this is purely 
ab abstract consideration. Every time the sound is being formed, it has to be completely under control in doing this. Because this is not pop music. This is compressed ideas. The ideas are being compressed and reduced down to their essence. You have eight or nine minutes to make your point. The choice is between going out <coughs> and using my QuickPix 4.2 megapixel camera to do this, or to take Eve's 16.7 um, gigapixel camera that can shoot as a lens this big, so it can shoot under two, two candle power, and it'll take a, a picture of mine and two candle power. It's just noise. And so you will always start everything from the highest possible quality, the highest possible level you have in getting the materials so that every part of every sound is perfect. And when Dominic Bazal a number of years ago went about doing mastering of electroacoustic pieces and talking about them, he would say to people, that is ugly. And they would say, wow, 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 what do you mean it's ugly? And he would say, he wasn't quite, a, he was pretty articulate, but he was very hard edged. But what he would say that that's edgy. And he heard it was edgy because his hearing worked at a very refined level. Someone who regularly shoots with a 16 megapixel camera, their eye just becomes sharper. And so working in, in an EA studio, every part of every sound that you are going to be working with. Pardon? You actually talk no He's recording right here. That's okay, he'll, he'll sink. That's okay, there we go. Sink! <laughs> <coughs> every part of every sound has to be considered. And this is why electroacoustic composition at this level, at the level of these pieces, is so difficult to do. We listen to these uh, the, the six winning pieces here, and we're amazed by the astounding quality of all the pieces. Because across the board, the composers, the six people involved in this, have achieved an enormously high level. This is a very hard piece to comment on because there's so little. I had to go and I had to go and dig and find something in here. But it, uh, there's other parts of this it's very hard to 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 do this with. But I'm trying to explain that the, everything here they, they they all ties together, and it's not a matter of going to free sound and pulling down an MP3 and just putting it together. The other part about this is a compositional one. And this is about the repeated sound. The exact repetition is a, is a problem that electroacoustic composers have to deal with on a continuous basis. You're going to have exact repetition or you're not going to have exact repetition. Let me just uh, this and see if I'm going, to, I'm going to try this. I don't know if it'll work. Okay, let's have a look and see if in fact this is an exact repetition. If you compare them one to the other, they tend, they don't look quite like exact repetition. But that could be because there's reverb on this that is distorting the multiple repetitions. But ignoring the background part, this part uh, has a duration of, let's say, um, 242 milliseconds. You'll see that I'm working, I'm working in seconds, but I prefer actually to be working in samples, especially at this level. I would view this, the unit I would use would be the samples. So what we're looking at is we're looking at a repetition rate of somewhere around, if you can, 11,000 samples, 11,000, and it's 48 kilohertz, so it's somewhere around 240 milliseconds. It's possible, if one is going to have this kind of repetition, to do some very interesting things psychoacoustically. 
one of them, for example, is to come down to this level and to just remove that much of the signal. Doesn't like that. Just to remove. Seven milliseconds of sound at this level. Just shorten one by seven milliseconds. Make another one fifteen milliseconds longer. Shorten another one by twelve. Make another one twenty-one milliseconds longer. Shorten another one by minuscule amounts. But in listening to players, performers, human musicians, when they play repeated notes, they may appear to be playing precisely, precisely, precisely. But they don't. They, there's, there's flux, there's fluctuation in here. And the brain responds positively to this. If you want this to be mechanical, simply, absolutely mechanical, then that's the thing, the thing to look for. But if it's going to be mechanical, I would say that the attack of going wah, 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 the wah is not sharp enough to get the mechanical aspect of that. It's still got this, this pulsating nature to it. So as a composer, you would decide whether the envelope corresponds to your intention. If you want a clearly mechanical repetition, then you've got to change the attack time. You're going to shorten the attack time to give it this quality of being there. And if you don't want that, then you leave a longer envelope and it'll be... This to me sounds a bit like the fire alarm at, uh, uh, on, on Friday at the uh, OCAD, where there was a fire alarm during the middle of the presentation. And it was a little distant, and the initial response of everyone in the room was, "Oh, that's interesting," because the attack of the beeping sound was being muted and was being modified by the acoustic of the space. Had it been in the room we were sitting in, it would have caused an immediate response in people. So, setting the envelope as to whether you want to—do you want this to be a mechanical sound? If you want to be a mechanical sound, a, an, an annoying mechanical sound? Annoying. Not annoying, just a mechanical sound. Just annoying. So what he's done, he has a mechanical sound, which is this exact repetition. And to avoid the annoyance, he's kept the envelopes of them a little longer. And so he ach accomplishes what he's setting out to do, which is to create this sense of mechanical. But there's other stuff which are, is to be considered here as well in doing this. And getting mechanical sounds to sound mechanical without sounding mechanical is, as you know, from trying to do this, a real challenge that you are you're dealing with. Here. Okay. So now I'm the, we, we're dealing with what I call high acousmatic art. This is uh, the, the grandchild of the original music concrete this is the art of using sound as sound brought to the highest levels which are there. One of the standards of this is that it's going to be done over multiple, multiple speakers. You can't play this in stereo. If it was, was this a, a multi-channel piece? Oh, it's a stereo piece. So it was going to be done as a, as a stereo piece with sound projection. If it's going to be done with sound projection, it can't be played in the radio as it is because it requires someone to change the levels and therefore this has to be a consideration. So there will be two mixes. One would be a radio mix and one would be the concert presentation mix in this way. There are a number of approaches to um, the use of two channels. This is being set up for sound projection on the system where there are pairs of speakers in this way. The two major divisions between in sound projection is whether or not there's a center speaker. If there's a center speaker, it's a, uh, there's a whole other paradigm going on. But the idea here is that somehow or other, this is a stereo-related piece. There's the, if we take this place right here and we look at the signal, these, these signals are phase correlated. You see this peak here, up here, and down here? This is part of the same signal in this way. And you can see there's the this and the, the, the this little thing. And the, you can see that they're largely 
a, it's largely a stereo signal. Stereo has some complexities because it only works really when you're sitting equally between the two speakers. So the composer has to work out a way of making sure that the person sitting on this side actually hears something from the other side. Let's have a listen to this second. very hard unless you're between the speakers to make much sense of what this space is because it just is kind of amorphously you know, so you need to be in the middle and the composer in doing this sits between the speakers all the time so when you're doing this in the studio <coughs> one of the things you need to do is you work there but you also get up and you walk away and you go sit on one side and you see whether or not the material you have is transportable to other people in the same space. My preferred space place to sit in a concert with sound projection is right behind the person doing the sound projection. Because the person doing the sound projection is going to try and balance the sound ideally for that one position. And every location further away from that position, the signal is being degraded in certain kinds of ways because as you get closer to one side, you will lose the other side and so on and so forth. So these are considerations in how to begin to work if one is going to work in stereo. The studio you worked in was dry, right? Mm -hmm. Was, was a, dry, a dry studio, acoustically very dry? You can tell it's acoustically dry because in order to compensate for the dryness of the studio, you added reverb. Mm -hmm. And the reverb you added doesn't work in other spaces because the other spaces are going to add reverb on top of that. Mm -hmm. And this is a, 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 a common issue it's been on going on for 30 years that the environment we work in in the studio we try to make as acoustically neutral and dry as possible and then working here we try and make it sound beautiful and the way to make sound sound beautiful is to add a little MSG to it you know what MSG is um, monosodium glutamate what is monosodium glutamate in French so <laughs> monosodium glutamate is a salt. It's what's called a psychoactive. Monosodium glutamate, when you when the tongue there's no, there's no taste to this salt. When the tongue gets it, the brain goes, I love that! I love that. And the brain goes, I love it! You take a dog turd and you put monosodium and you eat it. And the brain goes, I love it! I want more! <laughs> that's why there might be some limits to that's that's why that's why everyone loves sushi because monosodium glutamate occurs naturally in seaweed and therefore you can take the food you can wrap it in seaweed and the brain goes I love it high frequency phase garbage the brain loves it reflects a, a complex acoustical environment and the verb does that it just adds that to the this. And is so what is you it, is it something that, that do you think that it's something that's really physical or is it something that's, that's a question of habit? We've become so accustomed to, to being in open spaces and uh, No, the brain loves it, honey. Huh? And the brain loves it. Right. Does it does it does it does it affect like uh, your brain activity or is it something yeah, that's something in, 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 in the frequencies in, in that the rept the reptile brain. The repti the reptilian brain responds to it. It just gets it. Because complex reverberated spaces allow the head, without having to see anything, to determine what the space looks like, what the, what the nature of the shape is of the space. And therefore, it's hardwired into the brain to compare the two signals and see that, oh, yeah, there's an echo there, and 35 milliseconds later, there's an echo there. Therefore, that's a distance of 100 meters. It's a question of comfort. Pardon? It's a question of comfort. Comfort? It's more comfortable to be in a large space than in a closet. Well, it, it gives a lot of information. <laughs> if, 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 if Probably. 70,000 70, 70, years ago, when you were in the cave, and it was nighttime, 
you want to know how big the cave was and the brain adapted <laughs> to being able to detect these minute cha differences in time arrival to be able to, nego to be able to negotiate and navigate the environment it was in when it was dark because the eyes were no good at the night at night the only thing you had to work on was your ears and therefore the ears have to develop enormously intrinsically densely receptive and an analytic senses analytic, to be able to work this out because half the life, the person's life was spent in the, at night in the dark. And the, uh, the brain can't use the eyes for that, it has to rely upon the ears, so the sense of hearing. Your ears are on the side of your head for a reason. Consider that your eyes aren't on the side of your head. Pigeons have eyes on the side of the head. And in order for a pigeon to see 3D, it moves its head like this all the time. <laughs> because it gets two different images. And the only way it can combine the two different images is to keep inputting new images all the time. If people had their ears where horses had them on the front of the head like this, the only way we'd hear what's going on around us would be to have ears that moved, mm -hmm. which is why dogs and horses have ears that move in this way. We have ears in the side of our head because what we're dealing with here is a very complex system of psychoacoustics that is going to be able to decode the information. And reverberation is one of those things that the brain loves for a while until one hears reverb and the way to add reverb to a piece is to add it until you can hear it and when you, the moment you can hear it you have too much and what happens in the studio is after you've worked in the studio for a number of years we work with plugins a lot you hear reverb when it's five percent of the signal because your ear gets sharpened too the same way that once you've worked with a lot of echo slap echo you'll hear it inside sounds as well to decode that information and so as a composer it's a, you negotiate for, your, for yourself the amount you want to be appealing in a general sense to an audience because the audience will love the reverb and the amount you want to do the piece for your own benefit mm -hmm. so the idea would be to have a different layers of sound when you come into a concert hall you apply the reverb at that time only. Well, yes. But what happens according is... According to the space. According to the space. And so in which case, what you have to do is you have to make the sound transportable. This is an idea, it's the concept of that you're mm -hmm. continuously compromising on what you set out to do, the studio you work in, and where you're eventually going to have it played, and who's eventually going to do it. And the, all the compromises go on, they go on all the time, and unless you're a real bonehead which I can talk speak for that, I can say it's my about myself. The work I have done, I the, the last work I've done of you I've used no reverb, it's all point source, it's all just cut and paste and it's nothing, no almost no effects. Knowing that when it gets into a space which is out of doors or reverberant, it works a certain way. But I also don't want my work played in a reverberant space because I'm having 15 or 18 events in a second and reverberation, the, the natural reverb of the hall makes it garbage and so it has to be in, in, in a dry space but I'm prepared to look at that that it doesn't get, it's not transportable therefore the work I do in point source has to be listened to with headphones where there's no reverb if you want this listened to with headphones you may want to do two mixes yeah. one that's designed I actually went to do the piece one time I'd, I'd done it and the day before the performance, as I was playing it in the hall, I realized there was so much reverb. Mm. So I had to go home and I had to remove the reverb. I didn't have the submixes to remove it from. I used um, basically expansion units. I came back the following day with a new mix which had removed the reverb. Because the hall added this to it. And these are the kind of situations that as composers you face in determining what you're going to do in, in this kind of way. And the idea of look, thinking about the levels, and thinking about the relationships between the sounds within very quiet sounds, quiet areas, the relationships between this, all of these are impact you, you in the studio on a continuous basis. And the, the skill you will develop in the studio is to be able to extract this information in this kind of way. This is, as, as you saw, um, I. Just have a, we'll have a quick look at this piece in another domain. Um, compositionally, 
in terms of composition. Um, is this a sectional piece? And you can look at it and you can go, yeah, that's pretty sectional. Right? There's something here and then there's something else. There's something here and there's something else. Then this section is three somethings, which seem to be related. And then there's this section, and then there's these three. And looking at this, this is how I do this. That, this is how I listen to this piece for the first time, by the way, before I complete the file. Yeah. <coughs> Just so you know mm -hmm. what. I, right? And so I said, okay, so this is a narrative structure. This is a piece that has a beginning. It does something, it goes somewhere, it does something, and then comes to an end. And somehow the end here, you see this? That duration is about the same as this duration. And in fact, this duration is about the same as this duration. And that is a little longer than this one. And this one and this one about the same length. And this is about half the length of this one. So I see, oh, there's a, if I call this one, this is one. This is the duration of two. This is duration of two. This is the duration of three. Duration of three. Duration of two and three. One, two, three, 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 two, three. So the sections are going to get progressively longer. And looking at this, I see the beginning here. has set himself a daunting task. He set himself a daunting task because he's set up a set of criteria that he has to work by. He yeah. set up activity and stasis. Activity and this. What and stasis? not pardon? What stasis? stasis. State S T. S st static. 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 Stasis. A condition of dynamic and a condition of stasis, and there are no transitions. The transitions are done by butting together. So he's faced with a particular composition problem of how to build a piece which is going to, the material of which is action and then... And having seen the title, I thought, oh, I know that, that's cockroaches. Cockroaches scurry about, then they freeze. <laughs> <laughs> and then they scurry about, then they freeze again. <laughs> and they scurry about, and they freeze again. <laughs> this piece bugs you? <laughs> <laughs> so I listen to the piece, and I adjust my breathing to this. I adjust my physiology. So the composer has a problem. The composer has defined a set of parameters of what's going to happen in the piece, and then he has to fight them. Yeah. yeah. That's what, that was more an exposition to the piece. That's the exposition. Yeah. This is the introduction. This is like, here's the challenge. Yeah, you, take the, you take the glove, and you just put the glove down. So in listening to this piece from this point on, I've stored in my head that the composer has created a set of rules. And therefore, because having looked at the other shape, you want to take your coats off and uh, please. Yeah. 
and uh, we'll, we'll, if you if we can move you a bit so we can get you not know, right in front of the speakers that will help so we've determined that this is a narrative I determined by looking at it this is a narrative piece and I would guess that this is one followed by two followed by two followed by three three and then two and then three that these are somehow going to be somehow related to this some kind of expansion of this idea because working electroacoustics is not easy it doesn't it, you're going to write a sonata form you can write a sonata form you get an idea one you get an idea two you mix them together in the development section and you just have your student recopy them into the recapitulation and make the corrections for the but working in this is much more difficult. It's every piece is an invention of the form, and invention of the form based upon new kinds of sounds. And the sounds which are here are of a particular kind of nature. And let's have a quick look at that. Do you do you use a sonogram when you no. when you do? It it's it, it's invaluable because the you just make no, I change the grayscale. No, no, I, I need to change the window. Yeah. A, a sonogram. Let me just, I'm going to back off one second. I'm going to go back to this. <coughs> this is how. We're accustomed to working in the studio. Right? We're accustomed to working with this. And what we have here is we have time and we have amplitude. And that's how the loudspeaker works. In time, the loudspeaker can move in and out. But that's not how we hear. Because the brain doesn't work in continuous time. The brain does quantization of time. It takes 25 to 40 milliseconds, puts it into a little box, does an analysis of this and then outputs the information because if <coughs> this is the this is the imaginary scenario Eve has this camera there right and Eve's camera is going to take a picture of this camera through the panel right and he has a very very fast camera it takes a picture of we look at the picture and I ask you is the pen going up or is it going down I'm talking about a, a picture of with your, your shutter speed is very fast. Point 0.3 nanoseconds. Yeah, very fast. That yeah, is uh, uh, three ten billionths of a second. Yeah. That's pretty fast. Yeah. That's pretty fast. It locates it in space, but it doesn't locate it yeah. in it's the uncertainty. Thing. You look at any one of these samples, and all you know is the amplitude of the signal. You have no frequency. There's no frequency. There's no way you can tell me frequency. And this last thing you call is either out or in. in one location. The frequency are in your ears. No, the frequency is no, but I mean you hear them. The, the frequency. <laughs> well, that's a bit of, if, if you believe in time, then you can hear frequencies. But there's an assumption that you can. You, do you believe in time? I don't believe in time. <laughs> you see, what happened about 15 seconds ago was the universe stopped. And there was a space of 74 million years where nothing moved. And then the universe started. And you were not aware of that because we didn't have any way of measuring the time between when the universe stopped and when the universe all the time. There are those of us who are aware of that fragmentation of the universe. This is not how we hear. Because it's not how we hear, it gives us certain kinds of information, but it doesn't give us other kinds of information. And therefore, in my classes, the first thing that students do from day three is they convert all of their signals into spectrum. 
it takes a while to see the value of this. But there's a, there is a value as one comes to read spectrograms. On here, if you look down the bottom left hand corner down there, you can see down here, you can see the frequencies. You can see that this line through here, I'm going to blow this up a little bit. I'm going to reduce the bandwidth so it shows a little more clearly. And if I change the windowing, you'll see that the window allows me, I lose the, I lose time resolution. With the spectrogram, you either have good time resolution or you have good frequency resolution. To get both, then you need to use multiple windowing. But you can see that with this, I'm not doing this carefully, I'm just to, 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 to demonstrating. You can see that there's this, see this frequency right here? You, it's um, 1150 blah blah, whatever it is. Right? Down there. And there's another one here. And this is the, 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 the greater one, and that's uh, about 570, which is C sharp, does it say? C sharp? Yeah. Five. yeah. And then this one is around. So that's a partial of that. You see? This is C sharp, and that's another C sharp, and that may be the same. No, that's, not a, that's an inharmonic partial of that. But in looking at this, it's possible to determine where these center frequencies are. And what's interesting about that is that if you wanted to sharpen this sound, if you wanted to fine-tune this sound, you would go into a filter and you would set your frequency resonances of the filter, the bandpass filter, just with a 3 dB boost at these frequencies, and this sound would come out like this. At and so using the spectrogram, provides you with other kinds of information about the sound because you can use the statistical information the numerical, the metric information as to where these frequencies are if, if I play this in this way you'll see that it, the resolution the time resolution is all blurred but the frequency resolution is good back up here and now we get time resolution you can see the individual strokes in here in this way you can see these this way you can see where they occur in time but you're not getting good frequency resolution the frequency bands are blurred in that way and it's a useful tool to look at in this way let me just get another bandwidth up here And you'll find a way of changing this suit to suit using uh, the square window is uh, not actually very good Backman, but yeah, Backman is a little better on this situation. And you'll be able to see more about the signal you have in there. And you'll be able to see other kinds of signal. Let me go back out away. And you see these frequency bands here? down here and the question I have is well are these related to something that happened before and I can see that you see this in here is this one here so that signal is somehow these two signals are related to each other and these two aren't there's a cut probably a crossfade it looks like a crossfade because there may be a, 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 a direct cut and the spectrogram will begin to give information depending on how you set the amplitudes and, and stuff you begin to be able to extract other information that you can use compositionally because you can see that in your sound that you have you have frequency bands here, formant frequencies in here and they go up quite high, this goes this already at 5k up there begin to see that this 
other underlying characteristic is continuous sound which is underlying but it, it, it transitions from here to here it's not the same across this transition and in here I can't see these spectral bands so in listening to this section which is near the end of the piece I would or near the end of the section um, I would listen differently so one way to do this is to take this let me see if I can play this ask you to listen. There's, there's no subwoofer, well these, these are just small pseudomans. There's no low frequency here to begin with. But listen for this hum. This quality down here. You hear the hum down there? I'd, if I were doing this, I would remove that. It interferes with this part of the signal by shifting my attention down to something which is later on would be useful. But for the moment, I would like the listener's attention not to be drawn away by ex extraneous elements. You may decide that you want to have that. Different speakers would sound different because at least have a they have that resonance down there, so they don't help. But it would be an. A, an examination of this sound at the level of the detail as to whether or not this spectrum is exactly the one I want and whether this is what I want. And you can work through there and you can decide, yes, I like that, I don't like it. And then you will have taken the decision. It, to me, at this point, it sounds like an artifact of the recording, however. It sounds like... Pardon? Not the part of the recording. Of the recording, yeah. Rather no, than... No, it was recorded just that. Pardon? I recorded just that. The that low... That was the only thing I recorded. The low frequency? Yeah. And then you added that to the other side? Yeah. yeah. So that was a decision there. And it sounds like an artifact. So he wanted to create, for listeners who hear that, the sensation of an artifact. Because maybe the sound itself didn't sound as if it had other kind of individual artifacts in that way. This, this is where I think... Also, analyzing the piece on another level is important because the title of the piece is Parasite. Yeah. And throughout the piece, you have these, these bits of residue that are, that are compositional intention as well. So while this, is, this, is, this, this gets really, really detailed in listening to it uh, and can, can help shape the compositional idea, but does have to be taken into consideration. Why three sides? 
because you won it three times. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Just a decision. Right? Beethoven never did anything three times. Beethoven did it once, he did it twice, and the third time he changed. And so the decision to do something three times, but not four, is going to be a decision that is going to be inside the piece in that way. That's how I, and that's before I've actually listened to the piece. That's what I do. I work out the underlying sense of the detail, um, seeing it's a sectional piece, seeing that it's going to be narrative in nature, seeing that it's using going, probably going to use these sounds as principal source materials. So in my listening, I will track how this evolves throughout the piece. And then I will have the sensation as to whether or not this is a good balance to this, or whether in fact the piece should be longer, or whether in fact the piece should be shorter. It could be, as often happens in JTTP, that people have a great six and a half minute piece. It just happens it takes them eight minutes to do the piece. They haven't compressed haven't squeezed it in this way. The difficulty I had with this piece when I heard it the first time was here. Because as I told you, I listen in a I listen in my workspace, it's not a studio. And I have a fixed reference level. That my peaks are usually around 80, 81 dB. And therefore my average listening level is in the low seventies, high since low seventies. And this entire section disappeared. And so I had to go back and I had to work to extract from the piece what you had done. And the way I did that was I went back into here and I did what I have showed you before, which is I came into uh, the, the file and just get this out. And I applied about 12 dB of peak limiting to it. These speakers don't handle this very well, just yeah. as long as you know that these speakers are, are three. But this is what people listen on. This is with 12 dB of gain on this, and we're listening in here, and it's taken from here, essentially to here, for someone sitting this far away to begin to pick up what we had heard before. It's some very interesting sound in here, but the level change between here and here in terms of transportability makes this very a very difficult thing to have. While the electrically we may have 190 dB of dynamic range, in point of fact, acoustically, in most situations you're looking at 35, 40, I, nice times 45 dB dynamic range. Um, that's the, the technically the only thing which I had difficulty with this piece in, in that way. I found. Um, I figured that you actually have monitored at a higher level than yeah, I was monitoring. Maybe with headphones. Huh? Maybe with, headphones. You, with headphones? Yeah, maybe with headphones. Oh, with, if you're using headphones? No, not with headphones. Huh? For uh, the building, for the, uh, the compounds. Did you, you use headphones for the mixing? Yeah, headphones for mixing and um, in the studio. Um, the, the problem with headphones is that the acoustical environment is extremely dry. Mm -hmm. And the tendency with people doing headphone work is to add reverb mm -hmm. because they're not accustomed to the idea of just listening to the sound. Yeah. 
and by the coloration when it gets into the studio it has a color and then when it gets into the, the space like if we had the larger space downstairs not the small one um, the small one with the curtains would be reasonably but the bigger space mm. a lot of your detail will get lost because it's just going to get washed in, into this so it's the, all the way through we're dealing with these these kinds of uh, aspects of, of what it is we're dealing with it and I, I really think this is a multi-channel piece I don't think it's a, and I think it's a point source piece I don't think it's a stereo piece at all I think it's you need to decorrelate all of the signals and place yeah. place your sound there <coughs> and there mm -hmm. and there and there not try and create an illusion of having mm -hmm. width because the, the the complexity the density of the sound <laughs> For example, that, that repeated underneath it, which we can't see. I'm, I'm gonna take I'm gonna, to, I'm gonna take this section and loop it. basic premise of having stasis and activity at the same time. I hear the, well I'll, I'll, I'll call them drums, the mm -hmm. um, I hear that coming out of speakers all over the place, mm -hmm. randomly, yeah. but not in stereo. Yeah, no. There and then there and then there, point source, yeah. clearly point source. And the opening, the whale, <coughs> which is in there, I hear being located in one place which is not the same place was where the drums yeah. and the other layers are coming mm -hmm. from. And you've, I, if, if you had a chance, if you have the interest and have the opportunity to remix this up, but not remix yeah. it, but to reconstruct it into multi-channel yeah. point source, I would recommend either seven or nine channels, but not in the shoebox shape, but <coughs> placing the speakers. <coughs> Is something that when you work in more spaces, 
you'll come to uh, understand that I've already heard this in several places now. Yeah. And it doesn't sound the same. It's very yeah. sure. And if you want to have space adds its own color, then you can space adds its own color characteristics. The, the, the flatter you can get this, the more transportable. Because it doesn't carry mm -hmm. the color all the into the new space. Yeah. The new space is going to cut the color what you have called the color. That my proposition with people who are doing pieces in the studio is one less of work. Work with the spectrograph, but also work with the supplement all the time. And if you have the option to supplement, work in the studio has two supplements. The, the materials are richer than they than they are when it, when it comes out, and that's that's my concern. That if if you had if you didn't have anything here that was really strong, it would be a different issue. But you have lots of really strong stuff here. Many many strong things in here. Let's just take the end. Um, up, up here, this is a 3.5k, and you get to up to 5 or 6k, and it's it's still up. There's there's still material there, but you see, it's all kind of down here. Mm. It's all thumped down here, and th th the thinking is, oh yeah, well that's what that that's what I want. But one of the things to consider is the nature of the theatre of sound. <coughs> if you want this kind of effect, it doesn't mean that the sound you make. Because in theatre, if you want to produce the effect of order from the actor, Well thought out, it's what I call well thought. Well thought piece of money that 
it makes sense. So, you can find what you want to do. So, good. Thank you. Should we listen to the whole thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Let's, uh, now we've had a, an opportunity to... Uh, we, we, we heard it tonight in better conditions. Well, we'll hear it tonight in better conditions, in which case tonight that when you hear it, it'll be all that much easier to hear yeah. well, because you will know the piece mm -hmm. in some way. And the reason I gave the analysis first of the, of the sections like this in the piece <coughs> is to locate the listener in what I call rapid, rapid <laughs> listening or rapid hearing. The more information you can give the listener, the first mm -hmm. time they're going to hear the piece, yeah. the more they'll get out. Because in all likelihood, they will only hear it once. Mm -hmm. And some people say, I don't want to write a program note. I don't want to talk about my piece. Mm -hmm. I want you to experience it once. And I'm going, no, you misunderstand the nature of human beings. Mm -hmm. You're going to get one chance at this. If you give the listener lots of information beforehand, they come in with an educated ear, they will get that much out of it, that much more. And so I said, here, we will listen to this, and there's the introduction, there's the choir section, which is about twice as long, and then there's this, which is three times as long, and another choir section three times as long, and then the three, and then the twice as long as the opening, and then the three. And so when we listen to this, we'll keep track of where we are. Doing this. I'll go back. I'm going to show the spectrogram version, but run the uh, run the audio from the other file.
there was a there's a piece on a very well known electroacoustic label, C D label, which will remain nameless because Jean Francois would be very upset with me if I mentioned <laughs> <laughs> what what the label was. <coughs> and by a rather well known um, European composer and it's a cycle of pieces and I took the uh, the CD files and I, but what I do is when I first of all open the file if I get this file the first thing I do is what I just did I, I do the uh, the waveform stats <coughs> and I see what the average is, what the maximum is, good high average levels of minus 12, blah, 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 blah all, that, all that stuff. And so I took these, the five movements on this CD, and I did this because I always found the CD level to be very low. I found one wave that reached zero in the third movement of the piece. And everything, it, it, it was the, the single half wave was 9 dB above every other peak. So there was a the loss of 9 dB throughout the entire thing, between 9 and 10 dB. And I went in, and what I do in these situations, I show, I show the, the quick, see there's a DC offset stuff here. And what I would do, if, if this were a problem, I would take this area. Because I, I work a lot at uh, with wave level in this. And apart from DC offset, I would just, Amplify this by minus two dB, which is inaudible, but I've just gained the two dB of headroom, and I do a lot of manual in the in file. I go through and do a lot of this manual. I I see that this this peak, you, I could have started here equally well with the zero crossing here. And whatever, but and the the one down, the one that follows is is a bit the same. Um, I do, yeah, yeah. I found that it's possible to do because if you're doing the compression, which is electronic, I mean, it will work the same way. It's just that I could look at this and I can take this portion of the wave. and just take the 2 dB of, I just decrease the amplitude of that single peak by 2 dB. There's a gain 2 dB, if, and certain circumstances will gain 2 dB on the channel, and completely inaudibly, because it's just taking up the individual peaks. But the idea of working at that level in, with the signal, <coughs> I find to be important uh, for in dealing with, uh, in having the students understand what the signal is about, rather than thinking of the signal as being some kind of a block of sound, the signal is treated in a detailed fashion. And so here we can see where a lot of what they will call clipping is. I have a, a definition of distortion as well. Distortion is yes. un unwanted change of wave shape. That's my definition. You can't have a distortion pedal. Yeah, I use distortion because uh, it speaks about the world of guitar. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. yes. Because it, it's not distortion, it's just the, the, the distortion is when there's unwanted change. So students say, I, that, I put distortion in my piece. I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> you just did wave shaping. <coughs> it's a way of having them reconceive the, the sounds as being acceptable sound rather than being out extraordinary. Let's have a listen to the beginning. Just one other thing we'll do here. So we can see that 
there's stuff going all the way up to beyond 20k. <coughs> Did you work at 96k? The, the sampling rate? The, the, the sampling rate? Uh, 48. 48? Yeah. It shows. If this were done at 44, this this wouldn't be there. You would lose these. It would be this flat. And I encourage now I encourage the students who the, the better ones to work at 96 all the time because when they do the transformations of the sounds you can see up here these partials up here and this partial stuff up here this, this is going to give this a very a much wider range of possibilities of sound by having by not working at 44.1 uh, but by working at 48 So there's the piece. Okay, good. <laughs> so it, to me, it looks like a piece which is in, in two major sections. Um, I'm just saying what it, I'm, I'm, I'm not listening. I think you're five, six, no, wait, wait. I'm just saying okay, what okay, I, okay. I, 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 I haven't listened to it yet. Right? Okay, okay, okay. I've done the uh, analysis of the wave yes. to see the technical level. I look at this and I see that there's appear to be oh. a, there's a major division a point of articulation in the middle right there's a point of articulation a point of articulation and then this and then this looks like it's in two parts with the transition and this could be that there's more here that there's this kind of gap in here and maybe one two three. and it appears to be narrative in nature rather than stochastic rather than Kaiser Nietzsche <laughs> tends to be a narrative with it. Can you see the shape here? I mean, <coughs> this one. I, I, I'm not telling, I guess. No, I, yeah, I I, I, structure in contemporary acoustics is, uh, is, is something which musicologists will have to try and get into a bit more. I also do, I, I spoke about uh, the, the narrative, I also propose that people work in the concept of what I call energy analysis, which is how much energy is going on in the system and how the energy will be dissipated. The two basic kinds of structure being the impulse and the decay, or the impulse and the state. So bell is impulse decay, it's a transient, and what you have for a string is the continuous. And I encourage people to listen to the work in terms of whether or not the composer. 
Levels a bit high, so I'll bring it down. Here.
Est-ce que c'était l'intention d'être neuve belle? Did, did you want it to be a beautiful piece? It's <laughs> 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 just a question. Yes. Mm, did uh, you? Uh, okay. Yes. It does have different states. Um, some parts of the piece are very noisy. Mm. The end are almost melodic. Yes. And the yes, uh, if play, I could finish with a well, with a with a chord. Okay. It wasn't meant to be beautiful. It was meant to be energetic, with a, a lot of flow of energy. Continues. It, is it a collage? Oh uh, yes, uh, no. What were the sources for the collage? Okay. Uh, Other questions about the piece? Does anyone think the piece should be longer or shorter? Energy, yeah, and the, and the way it builds, especially in the last section, the way it builds, yeah, and it, it corresponds to really. If you know rock music, then then it's, it really does have this sort of dramatic flow of, of a, a big fat rock piece, the big sort of introspective guitar sort of soul at the end. So in that sense, it does have a it has a good flow, I think, in the dramaturgical form. Section one, section two, this could be section three, and that could be section four, and that could be section five. <coughs> but the sections are only vaguely clear. The, uh, you, you don't stop and then go have 20 seconds of silence. How long did you work on this piece? Or yep, hours and months? A year. A year. Yeah. It shows because of the level of detail and the nature of the the internal relationships are always very organic. They're not predictable, but they all fit in 
and the way things, the different energy levels work at the same time. It's good. I have. That's what I am. Do you have any questions? Yes. Alors, dis-le en français, on peut te le traduire. C'est un œuvre d'un jeune homme. Ouais. <rire> Ce n'est pas quelqu'un qui est âgé. C'est clairement quelqu'un qui, qui a beaucoup d'énergie. You, you have lots of energy in this. And that, and that shows. Because you don't release. What you do is you, you go there and then you pick up from here and you, you go on again and this drive moves the piece forward and moves it forward and moves it forward and it makes it very attractive because you you create a single image rather than an image which is energetic and then slowing <coughs> down you keep moving forward as you, you, you move on it, you could take another six seconds or eight seconds to do this but no you want to go on. That's very strong. That's very strong. Have you thought of doing a multi-channel? It's a, a, the difference between a diffusion, spatialization, a uh, projection sonore. Mm -hmm. it, you can do you can do space in different ways. Um, this could be five channels in front like this, yes. or seven, five like this and two up there. Then use the, the, the vertical of the front in like a, a large screen, like a theater, mm -hmm. a theater of sound that can go from here to here. But I think you would benefit from having speakers for separate channels mm -hmm. above to open the texture so that yes. your density, which is clear, would be allowed to speak more clearly mm -hmm. by being placed into different speakers, distinctly different speakers. Not
I think uh, this has been very good. I've learned a lot today. I know, I know it's been successful, but I've learned a lot. The more I've learned, the more successful it is. And I've learned an enormous amount today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.